to provide background information uh, to assist people like yourselves and all those who have been on our webinars to make presentations on your own. Uh, so to that end, we have a Word version of the submission and we will encourage you later in the program to go in and cut and paste it, cut, paste, drop, edit, strike through and add your own words. Uh, it's a template for you, um, courtesy of the Friends of the Green Belt Foundation funding. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, we chose the name of regional resilience uh, for a number of reasons uh, for this uh, series of webinars and our submission. Basically, we believe that this is a once in a generation opportunity to extend the green belt. Um, and we feel that the green belt was a great idea at the time, but with the changes that we're seeing in density and the growth plan um, and biodiversity loss and climate change, that we really need to extend it into the greater golden horseshoe. Um, and regional resilience we see as uh, that, that we can only protect the green belt and agricultural areas and our cities to the south and their source water if we protect the entire region, its ecological integrity, social well being, and economic prosperity. Um, it's also important to recognize, in terms of the social well being, that we have to acknowledge the history and cultural importance of the Green Belt and the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The whole of this area is inhabited by treaty people. In fact, we are all treaty people. This embraces the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee, early French and English settlers, and all Canadians today. We feel we are bound together by treaties and friendship, forged in the wealth of our lands and waters. And we hope that making this region resilient will include embracing the spirits of truth and reconciliation. Just a couple of brief uh, comments and then I'll be able to turn this over to Susan. Uh, as you may know, uh, this is hosted by the Ontario Headwaters Institute. Um, we are a registered charity. We've expanded far beyond our original terms of reference and our name. We are a full watershed management organization that delves into conservation authorities, land use planning, natural heritage and biodiversity, and indeed participate in several uh, aspects of protecting uh, receiving waters, including Lake Simcoe and the Great Lakes. Um, we are supported in this effort tonight by two consultants who have really added tremendous value. Uh, Lexi Whalen may be known to many of you. She's uh, a, an untiring volunteer for Land Over Landings, but she also has been our social media guru. She's provided proofreading, social media, um, and so much more. And tonight she will be the guardian of the questions and keep us focused. And secondly, I'm sure most of you know Susan Swale. Um, she is a registered professional planner with a background in public facilitation and sustainable land use planning. Um, she's a former counselor who has worked on Greenbelt issues for the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust, Environmental Defense, and the Ontario Greenbelt Alliance, and really brings a tremendous amount of philosophical and practical reality to the uh, threats and potential of the green belt. So I'm gonna turn it over to Susan and I'll come back in, um, in the usual 27 minutes. Go ahead, Susan. Susan, you're on mute. 28 minutes. <laughs> I think it's going to be 26 minutes because Deb Crandall is going to talk about Marine. So I'm just going to skip over that part and she's going to educate us all. So the province wants to talk, hear from you about growing the green belt, uh, the size of the green belt, as Andrew said. And you can access the online portal through the environmental registry to make your submission. Tonight, I'm going to run through our recommendations to the province. And as Andrew said, at the end of the presentation, he's going to tell you about some easy ways you can participate through using our resources. 
But don't take too long. The date for submissions, the deadline, is the 19th of April. So the consultation document asks six questions. Four of those questions address where to grow the green belt. And the last two ask how growing the green belt fits with the provincial priorities. So before I take you through how we answered those questions, let's look at the current context. Oh, there you go. So since 2018, uh, the province's environmental framework has been weakened. Ontario is a place to grow with growth and development prioritized over environmental health. It's important to acknowledge that these policy changes favor the private interests over good planning and the public interest. We consider our policy equilibrium to be out of sync. And growing the green belt, in addition to the policy changes on this slide, can help restore balance and build regional resiliency. So before this latest review began, there was a dialogue on how to proceed with growing the green belt. These ground rules were put forward by a number of community and environmental organizations. If the province chooses to grow the green belt, we want to make sure that we build on existing policy, we're not losing policy protections. The first rule, say no to land swaps or retain all land currently protected within the green belt, has been threatened by municipalities asking the province to remove land from the green belt. The fourth point, acknowledge that there is more than enough land to expand the green belt and to support housing and jobs within cities and towns, encourages the province to focus growth within our existing urban areas. We are hopeful that the province will abide by these rules. So what is the green belt? If you're not familiar with it, the dark green areas on the map identify the Greenbelt Plan area, the protected countryside as it's known. The Greenbelt Plan is a, is a provincial land use plan to protect some of the best agriculture in the region. The Greenbelt area encompasses three plans. Each one is unique. Together, they protect over 2 million acres of land in the Greater Toronto Area. The Niagara Escarpment Plan, the backbone of the Greenbelt, its limestone hills extend from Niagara to Tobermory, the medium green areas on the map. The Oak Ridges Marine is regulated by the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan. It's the light green across the top of Toronto, extending from Caledon over to the Rice Lake area. The Marine protects source water. I like to call it the life support system of the green belt. Now the green belt plan can be amended by an order in cabinet. It's different than the other two plans in that regard. And official plans, your municipal plans, must be brought into conformity with the Green Belt Plan. Right now, your municipalities are implementing, are going to be um, changing up, updating their official plans through the Municipal Comprehensive Review process, and they'll be updating with the 2017 Green Belt Plan policies. All Planning Act decisions within the Greenbelt area are required to conform to the plan and it is reviewed by the province every 10 years with the last review in 2015. This map illustrates the Greater Golden Horseshoe Plan area. In beige you see all the land that uh, is within the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The green areas are the Greenbelt and the purple areas are urban areas. The, green, the growth plan is kind of the flip side of the Greenbelt plan. It's a provincial land use plan which manages growth in the region by allocating people and jobs to regional governments. Those regional governments then in turn uh, give growth allocations to the lower tier municipalities. The, but the Greenbelt only covers 21% of the lands in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The balance of the land in the area is within the growth plan. And recent changes to the growth plan, lower density targets, extend growth plan forecasts out to 30 years, and allow settlement boundary expansions, which are contrary to building complete compact communities. These policies encourage sprawl. To limit sprawl and protect clean water resources, natural areas and farmland, 
Greenbelt protection should extend to the entire Greater Golden Horseshoe area, minus the settlement areas, of course. Let's turn that beige green. Not only is the green belt effective, but people love it. Over 90% support the green belt and 89% support expanding the green belt. People feel so strongly about the green belt that when the government introduced legislation in 2018 to allow development within it, the outpouring of support was so strong they had to backtrack. The green belt is effective at stopping sprawl and growing the green belt will reduce leapfrog development as well as reduce farmland loss. There are many benefits to growing the green belt, including improving connectivity between natural heritage features, wetlands, lakes, rivers, and headwater areas. The green belt retains agricultural lands, limiting development pressure, and supporting investment in agriculture for the long term. Sediment areas and their lake-based sewer pipes are not permitted into the green belt thereby providing a hard urban boundary. That's how it stops sprawl from not allowing those urban out areas on the outside to push up through the green belt. Now, oh, wrong way. There are many threats to the green belt. It is not a panacea. And the integrity is under threat by a number of different issues. Infrastructure projects are one. The Upper York Sewage Solution, proposed to service over 140,000 new homes in Upper York Region, which may either add effluent to sensitive Lake Simcoe watershed or result in the big pipe going through the Oak Ridges Moraine. There are a number of highway projects proposed or um, that may be resurrected because the province is right now updating the um, Greater Golden Horseshoe Transportation Plan to 2051. So the GTA West Highway, also known as the 413, the Bradford Bypass, and we think the Niagara GTA might be back again. There are also seven major transit stations in or adjacent to the Green Belt. Now infrastructure can pass through the Green Belt if it's servicing urban areas either beyond the Green Belt or if it's serving the rural communities or communities within the Green Belt. Now, uh, another threat is aggregates, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but aggregates are prioritized in Ontario, trumping uh, natural heritage systems and agriculture. And then the current municipal re comprehensive review process, as I said, the, the uh, municipalities are updating their plans with the new provincial plans. And uh, that process may allow urban the expansion of urban boundaries for towns and villages within the green belt. So while mi towns and villages outside uh, within the, like let's say Richmond Hill can't expand into the green belt going northwards, the towns and villages within the green belt can expand their boundaries. So you could kind of see it happening. We could eat away the green belt from within, which isn't good either. So there are also a number of compliance issues with some municipalities not following the plan and concerns that the province may not uphold the plan. So let's go on to where to grow the green belt. Now, as I mentioned, our approach to growing the green belt is to paint the Greater Golden Horseshoe area green. Let's just do it all. They want to grow everywhere. We want to green everywhere. Just as the growth plan manages growth across the region, the province should protect the land that feeds us, the water systems that sustain us, and the natural systems that protect biodiversity to support resiliency throughout the region. So the province asks us six questions. Um, let's turn our attention now about where the green belt can grow. In our provincial submission, we have maps and recommendations that are available uh, on the uh, waterscape.ca website. Um, and the first question the province asks are, what are your thoughts on the initial focus area to grow the green belt, the Paris Galt Moraine? So let's look at that map. This in map actually encompasses the watersheds within a number of moraine areas down in the Grand River watershed. 
but we're going to focus on the Paris Galt Moraine because that's what the province is asking us about. And you can kind of see that at the bottom there, right up against Hamilton and Milton. And the Grand River watershed feeds right into the Grand River, goes right down through Brantford and into uh, Lake Erie. This map identifies significant moraines west of the Greater Toronto Area, as I said. And the Periscalt Moraine itself provides drinking water to over 800,000 people right now. And by 2041, the population of the area is expected to grow to 1.3 million, mainly re reliant on groundwater systems. So it's essential that groundwater is protected from the accumulative impacts of development in the watershed. The uh, Periscalt Marine area identifies uh, this area, this map, I'm sorry, identifies water systems, including uh, river valleys, headwaters, wetlands, intermittent streams, discharge and recharge areas that all must be protected for watershed resilience. As the Periscalt Moraine is an area of high value aggregates, Provision needs to be made to restrict aggregate taking below the water table within the marine area, or you are putting those water sources at risk. So we recommend the province grows the green belt in the Paris Galt Moraine and the entirety of the Grand River watershed. A question two is uh, more of a clarification of if they do add the Paris Galt Moraine, how are you gonna move from a study area to a more defined boundary for the Paris Galt Moraine. So our submission suggests if they're going to do that, um, they need to have in-person public consultations. We also en encourage them to have meaningful consultations with Indigenous people. And we have a number of other recommendations that you can find on, uh, in our submission. And let's turn to question three, urban river valleys. This map identifies urban river valleys and headwaters that we recommend be added to the green belt. Urban river valleys provide many benefits, including maintaining the green infrastructure, such as wetlands, floodplains, and riparian edge. They enhance habitat and biodiversity, support a regional trail system, protect downstream areas from flooding, erosion, and excessive sedimentation. They provide healthy outdoor recreation opportunities, and protect cultural heritage sites. In the Ontario Headwaters Institute submission, we recommend the expansion of urban river valleys uh, to incorporate not only the Speed and Aramosa rivers through the Paris Galt Moraine, but the Nottawasaga River, the Carruthers Headwaters, the Rouge and Humber urban river valleys and headwaters, the river valleys and headwaters of the Lake Simcoe watershed, and the Grand River watershed. So we go beyond what the province is asking us. We try to do that in every area. So question four, what other areas should be considered as if the province is looking at growing the green belt? And we think, as I said earlier, that we should turn the Greater Golden Horseshoe green. So you'll see this map, it shows you the dark green that's the natural heritage system in the Greater Golden Horseshoe area. And the light green is the green belt. So it's kind of reversed from the maps I showed you earlier. Natural heritage systems should be contiguous. Whether features are inside or outside the green belt, they should be afforded the same protection for consistency and for long-term planning. Natural heritage system features also perform essential services as they provide clean air, water storage, and filtration. They maintain resilience to climate change, invasive species, flooding, and soil erosion. They sustain the water resource system, including groundwater quality and quantity critical for downstream cities and economic activities. These, these areas support agriculture, recreation, tourism, and rural communities. The OHI submission recommends growing the greenbelt throughout the Greater Golden Horseshoe Natural Heritage System. Our specific recommendation is we urge the province to undertake studies and consultation to add the Greater Golden Horseshoe Natural Heritage System, including headwater areas, to the greenbelt. And let's move on. Oh, sorry. I went too far. Oh, there we are. The Blue Belt Map. 
So this is a map of the Blue Belt. Now, I don't know how many of you were around back in 2015, 2017, when there were a coordinated review was happening of the Green Belt and Growth Plan. The province also did a consultation at that time asking about growing the Green Belt. And this map was produced by a number of organizations and uh, they called it the Blue Belt map because it's protecting water, sensitive water areas. And the OHI submission suggests adding a number of areas that were candidates for Green Belt protection through the Blue Belt map. And this map was created by the Oak Ridge's Marine Coalition. We, we encourage the province to add key areas, including, but not limited to, the headwaters of the Humber, Don and Rouge Rivers, Duffins and Carruthers Creeks, the south slope of the Oak Ridge's Marine and the Iroquois shoreline over there in Northumberland, the Luther Marsh, the entirety of the Orange, Orangeville, Waterloo Marines in Wellington County, the Grand River Watershed in Brant County, and the remainder of the Lake Simcoe Basin, as well as vulnerable water resources in the rest of Simcoe County. We need to protect all of these vulnerable areas. Adding them to the Green Belt would permanently safeguard critical water supplies, natural areas, and prime farmland from urban sprawl in the face of increasing population, development, and impacts from climate change. Now, this is the Marines of the Greater Golden Horseshoe Report by Deb Crandall. And she is going to talk about this later on. But I'll just tell you, this is my favorite map of the presentation. The colors are just exquisite. And we have more Marines. Isn't that wonderful? There's more areas to protect. These are sources of groundwater. That it's, just, it's just fabulous. So I'm going to leave this to Debbie Crandall to talk about later on. But... These are all significant areas that store groundwater and they all deserve protection. So to recap, question one, two, three, four, we have answered on the, on the provincial submission. Uh, they ask six questions, so we've got two more. Um, the, the last two ask how to reconcile the current government priorities with growing the green belt. And our extensive answers to these are in our submission, so I'm going to give you a brief overview next but let's just say we're putting a very positive spin on what they're trying to look at as a negative so let's just go to this so how should we balance or prioritize any potential green belt expansion with the other provincial priorities mentioned above so the priorities they mention are growth management infrastructure and transportation natural heritage system and agriculture so for the first growth management um, we talk about the provincial growth plan policies which require municipalities to allocate more land than is needed encourage land speculation and support sprawl which may in turn lead to higher taxes and municipal debt now the province doesn't want that to happen growing the green belt supports a balanced affordable approach to growth and will require municipalities to work towards complete compact communities OHI recommends the province fix a growth plan and prioritize growing the green belt to reduce land speculation, limit extending expensive urban services into the countryside, which contributes to housing affordability challenges and increases municipal debt. Infrastructure and transportation. In our submission, we highlight the problems with transportation and infrastructure projects that undermine the green belt's protected countryside by fragmenting agricultural systems and impacting the function of natural heritage system. Policies in the Green Belt allow infrastructure and as I've already failed, I've already, as I've already noted, they failed to consider the cumulative impacts of in infrastructure. Also building infrastructure in the Green Belt is inefficient as it fails to capture land value. For example, it, it's not fiscally prudent to locate transit stations in the Green Belt as a density of 150 people per hectare is required to meet ridership targets. Urban development is not permitted in the Green Belt, so you're putting transit stations where you can't have that urban growth that's needed around them to support ridership, so we're losing money on those. And COVID has shifted transportation models, and these pa changing patterns need to be re-examined as the province moves forward with any plans for transportation. As the province considers growing the Green Belt, 
OHI recommends prioritizing the alignment of mobility infrastructure with existing built-up areas and rescind projects that encourage urban development in the protected countryside and prime agricultural areas, including canceling the GTA West, Bradford Bypass highways, rescinding plans to build transit stations in or adjacent to the Greenbelt, and update transportation models with post-COVID commuting data. As I've already noted, our, our uh, response to growing the Greenbelt throughout the natural heritage system, I'm not going to reiterate that. Uh, we have that in uh, question five. We do have a section on agriculture, I mean on uh, natural heritage systems. But let's turn to agriculture. So the last bullet that the province asks is about agriculture and how do we meet the priorities of agriculture and grow the Greenbelt? Well, that, we think that's pretty uh, easy to do. We should uh, allow agriculture throughout the Greater Golden Horseshoe Greenbelt area, right? So let's add agriculture. Uh, only 5% of land as Canada is fertile enough to grow crops. Prime agricultural land is a finite resource that needs protection. We are losing up to 175 acres a day of prime farmland. Land use la planning, uh, in land use planning, urban development trumps agriculture and some of the best soils are located near our urban areas in what's called the White Belt. OHI supports a submission made by the Ontario Farmland Trust to grow the Green Belt across the Greater Golden Horseshoe agricultural system. And the final question that the province asks us, question six, are there other priorities that should be considered? And yes, there are some priorities that should be considered, especially now in COVID, health and well-being, climate change and biodiversity, regional resilience and aggregates. We think the province needs to consider health and well-being as COVID has underlined how vital the natural environment is for public health, wellness and recreational purposes. 20 to 30 minutes a day of nat in nature leads to better health outcomes. Growing the Greenbelt along the natural heritage system is a cost-effective way to address physical and mental health. Climate change and biodiversity. Expanding Ontario's Greenbelt is key to a more resilient region. The Greenbelt's protected countryside provides a reservoir of natural infrastructure. Forests, rivers and wetlands filter the air and water decrease temperatures, prevent floods, reduce soil erosion, support biodiversity and absorb carbon. Growing the green belt builds upon the regional resilience needed to mitigate the changing climate. And regional resilience. Since 2018, policy changes have been made that benefit private interests and degrade the, our environmental health. In order to restore balance, support well-being and prosperity, we encourage the province to grow the green belt. OHI encourages the province to pursue a wide-ranging set of new policies which embrace a fair and green recovery that ensures regional resilience to support ecological integrity, social vitality, and economic prosperity. And the final bullet, aggregates. So if you read our full submission, I explained the provincial prioritization of aggregates over natural heritage. In 2017, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario called on the province to decrease aggregate demand, strengthen the province's power to protect the environment, and improve rehabilitation, rehabilitation uh, rates through better enforcement. Instead, the province continues to prioritize aggregate production over natural heritage. So there are some areas within the Greater Golden Horseshoe that have uh, their local policies are stronger on aggregates uh, than the Greenbelt plan is it's fairly permissive. So we are encouraging the province to allow uh, local policies to prevail if they are more restrictive than the green belt or more protective than the green belt. Um, and we also encourage um, our submission, our recommendation on the aggregate piece as well is we support comments by Greenbelt stakeholders to prohibit new aggregate extraction throughout the natural heritage system, both inside and outside the Greenbelt. And that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Deb Crandall now to talk about moraines. Thanks, Susan. 
Oh, so what I've done is I have on the in the chat, I have included a the copy of our Marines of the Greater Golden Horseshoe report. So I will be showing some of the maps. Do let me bring up my PowerPoint. There you go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it in this way because I'm don't use my printer anymore, and I'm just going to use this so I can see where I am within the presentation. Um, so this, thanks very much. This is uh, t want to just talk about the Marines of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Um, here's a, a pretty wonderful uh, graphic that shows this is at the height of the Wisconsin um, Ice Age, and it's this is the the Laurentide Ice Sheet was the con it was the continental ice sheet for North America, and it. Um, it, it was at least two, two miles thick of ice that extended all the way down to kind of middle um, of Ohio. And the thing about this report, this having this project was it just reinforced the, um, the understanding that we are a glaciated landscape. And if anybody has driven south, south you know on the way to florida you will see a, a drastic change in the landscape from what we know which is these hilly cames and valleys um smaller little river systems that um but multiple but very numerous river systems and then you get into the flatter older kind of settled landscape of the south so we are children of the of glaciers that's what our experience is and having this project was, doing this project was really, really exciting. Um, and as Susan said, we have a lot of moraines and this is a graphic that was modified from those two amazing geographers, Chapman and Putnam, who basically walked across South Central Ontario, mapping it. And it is the, it's the um, foundation for the, a lot of the work that has taken, that has happened since then in geomorphology, physiography, geology, etc. And the takeaway from this graphic is that we have these moraines and this very interesting landscape because of the presence of these large bodies of water and these large basins that have over the many millennial, because we've had we've had ice ages for there's been four within the quaternary ice, the quaternary period, many before that. So it's it's been a lot of glaciation, a lot of movement of ice and water, um, and it is the interaction between lobes of ice coming in and out of these uh, um, lake basins that have created this really interesting landscape. So we have the Lake Ontario down here. Oh wait, can't do that. Lake Ontario here. Um, Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, Lake Erie. And um, we'll look at this map later, but here's what I like to call the grandmama of them all, which is the Oak Ridges Moraine. Not that I have any kind of bias at all towards it. Um, we have the Oro Moraine up in here. We've got here, we've got the wonderful Paris Galt. There's, there's so many, the Trafalgar Moraines over here. We've got um, the Orangeville Moraine and these ones here, you know, don't have a lot of a um, lot of information about those particular ones, but this is very strongly a glaciated landscape. As Susan mentioned, the Oak Ridges Marine Partnership, which was EcoSpark, Storm, and Ontario Nature, was asked by the Greenbelt Foundation to um, to get behind and to coordinate efforts to create a blue belt. And so this was in 2017. It was during the review of the four uh, the four growth plan, the four plans, conservation plans. Um, and so here's a map that we produced. It's um, made up of many different layers. That, so there is, the, the strength of this is that there's no one set criteria. However, um, um, so it is really informed by those regional, um, the regional differences and the regional desires of a lot of the community groups. And so that was kind of a starting point, and that was a very successful um, initiative because it really it the government at the time came back with a 
and provincial schematics saying, we want to grow the green belt. Here are some of the areas. And this is one of the maps that shows the different Marines. And part of the exercise here was to look at the power of mapping. And that's something that came up very strongly. And I do touch on in the report, working with Chris Brackley of As the Crow Flies, who that, that you can tell stories through the map. So here's one map, there's another map, very different kind of a very blocky approach. And then through, these are the maps that we produced. Um, and this, as I said, was working with Chris Brackley as the, as the crow flies. And these were a, the data layers involved, um, groundwater recharge areas, hummocky topography, ice contact stratified drift. So there's a number of different layers that were brought together on this. And we have um, shared the shape files with the Protect Our Moraine crew up in the Paris Gulf. So that the maps that they have, which are, again, there's no truth here. That that's the perspective that the geologists have taken and a lot of the uh, Ministry of the Environment folk. This is a different, this tells a different story. And so the important thing is to kind of um, work through a process where you land on the, the criteria that you want. Um, so we think that moraines that, to answer the question about where should the, the, the green belt be grown very strongly, that moraines are, are a feature, a landscape, a, a geologic entity that are very important and that they need protection. And you know, a lot of you will know this, but they are really the source of, of drinking water. Oak Ridge's Moraine, um, over a quarter of a million people get water directly from the, from the Moraine. The Oro Moraine is a major source of, of uh, groundwater, drinking source, um, periscalt, etc. So it's a, an important drinking water source for, for communities. Um, the whole idea of making communities more resilient to climate change, when you consider the, this big hunk of sand and gravel that sits there, basically storing, keeping cool, delivering that water when we need it at times when, you know, we're now, I'm, our family's now in farming and we're, the droughts that we've had over the last several years, if we didn't have the base flow coming out of the, out of, out of the moraines and out of the ground, then we would be in really dire situation. So it's really important and it's going to be more important as climate change, change, climate change takes hold. They are really part of a natural, a larger regional natural heritage system. And it's really a function of the fact that because they're hilly, because they, the, the, the caims are steeper, that there are more incised um, stream and river valleys, means that they couldn't be cut down, settled as much as other places. So they do, the canvas is very strongly painted in on marine systems and they provide us with a kind of a, a core area in that larger regional natural heritage system. And of course, the, why they need protection is because they are, people wanna live there, people wanna take the sand and gravel from them, people wanna take their water. So if there's any candidate for protection, it would be something like the moraine, which has all the things that we as humans want and take. So just, I mean, I, I, meant, I forgot to um, start my stopwatch. So let me know, Susan, when you want me to be, to slow down. So of course we've seen this a million times, but you can't emphasize it enough. In my mind, it's all about water. And uh, without water, we don't have much of anything. Um, so what I'm going to do with these next little slides is just go through, I'm not going to go into any detail. That's why I've included the um, report on the side, but just to show you the structure of the report that I, we put together, we mapped these, the, all of the Marines, and then we took the, the different Marine areas. So the reason we call it a Marine area is that um, until we are really certain of the different criteria that are to be used, we can only describe it as an area. We wouldn't want people to think that that is in fact the ipso facto boundary because like bound, maps are, you gotta have power and you gotta be careful with maps. So um, for each of the different marine areas created a set bit of information, basically, 
using this report is for, for communities to use as a primer and as um, an information source for them to advocate for protection of their own moraines. So um, just went and had fun, did a lot of Google searching, just talking to people and coming up with these different profiles. So as I said, each of the marine areas have these different profiles. So the Aura Moraine is up in Simcoe County and it is, um, it's uh, as, cl as close as the Periscope Moraine is to having a conservation plan and act, the Aura Moraine is the next candidate. It's well mapped, it's understood, the champion, there's so many champions there. So it is a candidate that would be ready immediately to have some kind of conservation planning put on it. Here we have the Sim Singhampton Gibraltar Marine areas, a little bit not as well known. Um, and it's a lot of it is out of, a lot of the, this area is out of the greater Golden Horseshoe, um, but lots are inside. And um, what I've discovered is that the area up in Kalapur, so the Kalapur Creek is a, an amazing creek system that's got its headwaters in the uh, Gibraltar Moraine. And our farm gets um, freshly caught trout from a hatchery up in Kalapur. So if anybody has ever spent any time up there, it is spectacular um, and uh, could possibly be in need of protection because of the migration of people north. A lot of people seem to be moving up into that area. Uh, here's the Orangeville Moraine area. The Orangeville Moraine is, as a geo as when I went to school at Guelph for geology, we learned about this marine system because of it, the complexity. It has influences from Lake Ontario, Simcoe, and Georgian Bay. Highly complex, um, and again, the really needing to put area around that because I'd say a geologist would say, look at that and go, that's not what we see. So, um, but the, our mapping produced this result. Periscalt. Um, these are two different marine systems and um, with greater influence from different lobes defining each one. This, of course, Mike Schreiner has come out of the gate with, with um, a second reading on a conservation act for this. And um, I think it's got a pretty good chance of, of moving forward. And then here we have the Waterloo Marine. Um, fascinating marine system with lots and lots of information. And this particular moraine, similar to the Oak Ridges Moraine, is um, all about groundwater. It is, uh, that whole area draws its water from the moraine, but also innovations in hydrogeology. So um, I put the report there. This is just a, a cover page just uh, for of, of the report that we did. And it was, of course, funded by the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation. So. If anybody has any questions, um, the report is, as I said, available to everybody. They can pull from it what they want. We will be submitting this plus another preamble as part of our submission to the province on this um, Greenbelt consultation. So that's what I have to say. Absolutely fabulous, Deb. Thank you. Um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. if. <laughs> Uh, Susan, if you could put back up uh, our, our PowerPoint for a second. Um, while you're doing that, Deb knows, and I want everybody to know, I mentioned it earlier, our Appendix B is open for to support other groups suggesting new mapping for new Greenbelt areas. And hopefully, Deb, you will select, um, you will provide a selection of your candidate areas and we'll reflect our support for those in our appendix B. Perfect. So I'm just gonna highlight where we are and open this up to questions. Um, the consultation posed four questions. Uh, questions one and two were about the Paris Gulf Marine and what should the province do uh, other than once they get beyond a simple area a concept and we've said yes very definitely the Paris Gulch should be added and once you have a boundary there should be public meetings after the pandemic so people can look at maps and do a proper discussion and consultation on the areas and that that should also involve indigenous peoples. Uh, question three was are you in favor of urban river valleys? We are we, have, we will note that there's none flowing into the Grand. They're all Lake Ontario currently. And we think there should be some for Lake Erie. Um, 
Unfortunately, the Grand comes to a very narrow mouth on Lake Erie, but there could be lots of urban river valleys beyond the Greenbelt's current western terminus. Uh, and we also suggest that we need to tie those to the headwaters. Just designating something in urban river valleys doesn't necessarily connote the ecosystem benefits of the whole area. Question four was, do you have any suggestions about other areas to add? We think the whole of the natural heritage system, which is contiguous from the green belt through the greater Golden Horseshoe should be added. We have the brown belt map for the agricultural system, which should be uh, uh, contemplated for addition. The lands in the blue belt map, particularly in the east, the Iroquois shoreline and the Iroquois plain, as well as the what we're calling the moraines in the Crandall study. Deb, you have, uh, we're not even referring to storm study, we call it the Crandall study. And in, in homage to you, we'll, we don't want to put you on the spot for that. You're shaking your head. We'll, we'll have to chat about uh, making sure this is uh, updated in a way that's comfortable for you. And then finally, other key headwater areas. It's really interesting that in spite of all of these different systems, uh, there are headwater areas that are not captured in mapping. Part of that is because several headwater areas are intermittent or ephemeral stream fill and the mapping doesn't include those. So those are areas. Deb, uh, uh, Susan also touched on the eight policy issues that we've touched on for question five and six. Just gonna list them machine gun style, growth management, transportation, and infrastructure, stop the highways, natural heritage and agriculture, health and well-being, climate change and biodiversity, regional resilience and aggregates. There's a fair amount of text in our submission. We encourage you to avail yourself of it. And finally, how can you participate? Slide, please. Um, everything is on waterscape.ca backslash regional resilience. You don't have to remember all that. If you go to waterscape.ca, there's a hyperlink to take you directly to uh, this submission exercise. Your submission is required by the end of day, Monday, April the 19th. The resources we have online for you include a PDF. I happen to like them because they download in a compact, instantaneous manner and you don't lose any formatting. It's a good place to start reading. Um, we also have a Word version um, that you, as I said earlier, you can cut and paste, borrow, strike through, add a sentence, use that as a template for your own submission. We're going to add tonight our PowerPoint so that if you have friends who haven't seen this, uh, you can also, they can go through the PowerPoint at their own speed. And then finally, this is a bonus. Our grant is actually for the public education outreach, but we are also submitting recommendations and we have some software that will allow you to say, yes, click. I endorse the OHI's recommendations uh, they're just the 700 words from the 17 page submission. And uh, when you click on that, it will send your endorsement to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. And if you put in your, po your uh, postal code, a copy will also automatically be sent to your MPP. So without further ado, you've been very patient. It's perfect. We're under an hour for our presentation and Deb's amazing presentation. I would like to throw it open to questions. Uh, again, you can uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself when acknowledged. And Lexi is gonna steer me to questions in the, um, in the chat. 